Richard really, really, really wanted me to do yet another talk on the 41CL. But I said, I'm Richard, Richard, I, I can only do one a year. It just wears me out. So instead, I thought I would do the next best thing, and we'll talk about one of David Ramsey's favorite things, something, 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 dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll move it. There we go. I'm going to talk about this, uh, a takeoff of Valentin's series in praise of the SR-56 calculator. You say, SR what? <laughs> SR-56 calculator was one of TI's handheld programmables dating from early 1976. I happen to have one here that works just fine and is in very good shape. The keys actually register all the clicks. So I wish I had sent this to ACO a few years ago. So you're saying it goes into premium? No, it is not for <laughs> Joe, come on. <laughs> anyway, pass that around if anyone would like to look at it. So I'm, I'm going to talk about why bother with the SR-56, and by extension, I'm sure, any TI calculator, of course, of course. Give an overview of the SR-56, a comparison to its nearest competition, which was the HP-25, which we all know and love, and then try to give you some reasons for why you really should own one anyway. So in first step, why bother? Why bother? Well, in any kind of competitive situation, there are winners and losers. Sometimes it's a little difficult to tell the difference. So when I want to talk to a sales team, I always make sure they understand really what it means to be a loser. And I want to share some motivational, really they're de-motivational posters with you. Maybe this will set the tone. Mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> there are days I have felt like that is my ship, and it's going down. Defeat. For every winner, there are dozens of losers. Odds are you're one of them. <laughs> now, that doesn't necessarily mean the SR-56 is this trailing runner up here. And then this last one, I like this one. Stupidity. Quitters never win, winners never quit, but those who never win and never quit are idiots. <laughs> well, without competition that we had in the 70s and 80s, we wouldn't have many of the toys that we know and love today. Think of the competition between Apple and the IBM PC and how that fought on for years, and it seems as if it's still ongoing in some ways, at least not with IBM. Well, let's talk about the SR-56. I'm going to argue it's really not a loser. All right, first of all, look at that lovely industrial design over there. It at least is professional. It's not a frozen purple color. <laughs> so it's important to know your competition, even from many years ago, in my opinion. I believe you really should know your competition. The SR-56 was introduced on May the 21st, 1976. It has 100 unmerged program steps. The only merged step is the shift key, the second function key up there in the top left. 100 merged steps. Now, the 25 had 49. There are 10 data registers, 0 through 9, so 10 data registers. There is an independent test register. This button right here, the X exchange T, takes a value that's in the display and puts it into a special T register for tests and your conditional evaluations are against that value in the T register. You don't have a stack where you can just have values floating around to compare to, and that was carried over into the SR-56, I'm sorry, the uh, TI-5859 series. Sometimes that's brilliant. It really is a great thing to have something that's not affected by anything that's going on in your calculation, and other times it's a royal pain because you've always got to keep swapping things out of that test register to be able to compare new stuff to it. It has subroutines. The shift of the parentheses keys are a subroutine in return. And so in those 100 unmerged steps, you can have up to four levels of subroutines. Each subroutine requires the invocation of the subroutine function, so second subroutine, a two-digit address for where to go to to start that subroutine, and a return at the end of it. So it takes four of those 100 steps for each uh, subroutine. So that can be quite a memory eater really quick. Uh, like many of the other uh, TIs of this era, it had a printer available, and so it has dedicated print functions here at the bottom for print, to print the display, advance the paper, that became advance on the TI-5859, or to list your program. 
These are IR and IR printers. This was a cradle that you would take the battery pack out right. and put down on it. Got it. And the original one would work with the SR52, the SR56, and it turned out with the SR51, one of the uh, non-programmable ones because they had that same row of interface uh, spots inside the battery pack. But if you pop the batteries out, you lose the program. You plug it into the printer. Well, this one doesn't have constant memory anyway. So if you're going to do something, you, you, you would do your development over there on the printer if you want to use in the printer. It does have DSZ looping. DSZ looping. And the inverse of it is not actually to increment and skip on zero, but it's to decrement and skip on non-zero. So it's to loop based on whether it was zero or non-zero. But it did have looping built into it as well. Generally speaking, it was cheap. On average, throughout its lifetime, compared to the HP 25, it's anywhere from $20 to $50 cheaper than the HP 25 was. And that was really the selling point of all the TI models anyway, let's face it. They, in many ways, perhaps were more widely available, but they were cheap. They were cheap. For example, in fall 1977, granted this is at the tail end of the lifetime of both the 25 and the 56, the HP 25, I found a cheap price of $110, but $65 for this SR56. What was the original retail on the SR56? I had that in a, a, a chart, but it was $180 compared to $200, I think. Yeah, 195 for the 25. So it was about $20 to $50 cheaper on average over the lifetime. It uses <laughs> key codes. So there is a display of the key code 84, which is the plus key. So much like the 25, you get a step number and a single key code over here. Now, this screenshot shows one of the two unique features of the SR56 that have never again been used in history of any calculator. Some of you know what it is. But can you spot what it is? Grady. The letter is SR56. <laughs> Here's an SR56 made by Compex. I have one at home. But no, it is this switch right here. The TI had a degree radiance switch on many of their calculators, but that's degrees grads. What on earth? Degrees grads and radians. This one is degrees and grads, and if you want radians, there's a keyboard function to turn it on or off. <laughs> second radians puts it in radians mode as the program is running. Inverse second radians puts it into degrees. Or the switch. Is this part of the loopy aspect? No. I'm the loopy aspect. <laughs> okay. First of all, a couple of questions about the SR56. I'm wondering if it's a six-bit machine. Because I only count 62 unique opcodes on the SR56. They are in this chart, all of them. These are the different functions. These functions in this bottom corner are these functions written in blue down at the bottom. If you want to perform a sigma plus or a mean or the polar rectangular conversions, you have to hit second and then this function of n button right up here on the second row above the learn key. Second, function of n, sigma plus. Do you know how much of a pain that is if you're trying to accumulate data were, points? No, if you were doing that in a program, could you program those functions as well? You, if to if do this so, in a program, it takes two steps. Okay. You have not, to have the function of three. n key code, okay. and then the sigma plus so key code. So second fn is just one. It's one step. Then, second okay. is always merged, but that's two. But these are two byte functions, more or less. And it seems yeah. like it's running a program, because the display will flicker like it's running some kind of internal program. Yeah. So 62 unique opcodes, that, that's six bit. Why on earth do this double uh, opcode here unless it's 6-bit? Why not just have them be primary functions? I, so I don't know. Again, another look of the design. I've always been in love with this majestic line of the uh, TIs because it was very professional looking. It, I just, this has always appealed to me and that's what I first became exposed to when I was growing up like many of us did. That's what we always look back on. This is not so appealing. This is the battery compartment of the SR56. Many of these era TI machines have prongs broken off if you buy them on eBay. Because these little springy guys in here push down when the battery pack goes in and make contact against the two terminals of the battery pack. And if you have any kid in the house, they'll get those and just wiggle them. Look at this, boss. Snap. Uh, and so you find those either corroded and broken off or totally just broken off. Here's the circuit board. All sorts of little goodies in there. This is the row of contacts that makes contact against the similar uh, opposite contacts on the printer when you put it on the printer. 
This you saw last year, this was kind of the programmable landscape in mid-76. You had the high-end kind of things. You had the HP-65 and the SR-52. And then you had the HP-25 and its competition here, the SR-56. Uh, you finally had some competition, at least, with programmability. Eric? Gene, I was going to point out, you probably already know, but that, that, that chipset that you showed, the processor chip, the TMC-0501, is the same processor used in the SR-52 and the 59 and the SR-60 that Dave showed us. It's a 4-bit processor, so it's highly likely that those instructions are actually 8-bit and that they just didn't use very many. Oh, the shame of the designers. Shame of the designers. I had no, thank you, I had no idea, but I couldn't figure out why they would have only had 62 unique and then the double up stuff. Um, Make it when the SR56 is introduced, the HP25 has been out about eight or nine months, mm -hmm. so it had quite a head start. Let's look at a comparison side by side of these in terms of functionality. The cost, the SR56 is 179 at launch. And by the end of 76, all the way down to 110, so it dropped uh, 70 dollars in about eight, uh, six or eight months. Same over here for the 25 operation. The SR56 is AOS with seven pending operations. Program steps: 100 versus 49. Merge second key only versus all on the HP25. Data memories: 10 versus 8. Uh, accuracy: 12 digits on the TI models and 10 on the 25. And I'm well aware of the is 10 good digits better than 12, you know, digits? I remember all that stuff. But at the time, hold on, Richard. At the time, at the time, I would say the SR56 is better than the 25 for this reason. Making 2 to the third power equal 8 isn't here yet with the 25. That happens with the 91, which is after, well after, that's in late 76 with the HP 91 and the 67 and all that stuff. So. I would say if you were to compare side by side most of the time, the 56 is probably going to win a bit on accuracy compared to the 25. Richard? That famous quote that you just, by Khan? Yes. I went looking for that paper because I wanted to reference it. I couldn't find it anywhere near it. That's the one that talks about our 10 good digits yeah, I, better I, I, than 12 I, I, bad ones? 10 clean digits better than 13 dirty digits. I think that's mm -hmm. what it's <laughs> Um, conditionals, you've got essentially the conditionals on, on both. You have is X equal to that unknown T register or X not equal to it? Is X greater than or equal or less than or equal to it? And if T is zero, you've got the against zero tests. Versus, of course, the comparisons X and Y over there against uh, uh, zero or not. Um, but uh, so roughly the same on those. Subroutines, yes and no, right? This, at the TI has subroutines, the HP does not. The display is 10 plus 2, and on the HP it's 10 or 8 plus 2. And then again, I wanted to show these out. These are some unique functions on each model. Something on the HP 25 that's not on the SR56, and things on the SR56 that are not on the HP 25. The HP 25 has these four functions that are not on the TI. It has engineering notation, a percent key, and then the hours and hours, minutes, seconds conversions. On the uh, SR56, you've got few more here, right? You've got the uh, DSZ looping, you've got the four levels of subroutine, you have a reset, which is essentially a jump back to step zero and keep running, an unconditional branch. You have exchange the display with any memory register on the SR56, and then you have a pause key that has a different function. I'll show that in a minute. It not only pauses while running the program, but allows you to do something else that's a bit interesting. Other unique things, we talked about the printer and then the functions that go against the printer. The battery pack, the SR56, is three double A's versus two double A's on the HP25. Battery life, even with that, uh, the SR56 is two hours 40 minutes with a good set of batteries versus three hours 15 on the HP25. Uh, the display brightness, this came from a PPC Journal article, so it must be true. Uh, the SR56, the display, the LEDs, is supposedly about four times brighter than the HP25. That came from someone's PhD proposal back there in the PPC journal. Program speed, this is where the 25 certainly shines. The SR56 is a good bit slower. It's about 24-25% uh, slower running similar types of stuff as the HP25. No uh, comparison would be valid without trying to have one program written for the HP 25 and redoing it on the SR 56. So, the best HP 25 programs ever done 
are in the uh, PPC journal in the HP25 library. There were quite a few of those. If you would start those around. This is a copy of the presentation. The last page shows the HP25 L10 library program that computes the gamma function. And I took that program and tried to rewrite it using AOS on the SR56. And this is the approximation that it uses. And Amir, the approximations yeah. we've seen recently weren't around when he was doing this program. So it's got this stuff, right? A couple of logs and some uh, computations over here. Um, you can compare them side by side because I didn't try to do anything uh, unusual. I tried to just do a brute force computing. And uh, after I did this, I won't tell you how many iterations I had just to try to get the correct answer. It finally hit me why I really am not all the way back in TI land in any way, because this is a pain. <laughs> this is a pain. I've got extra parentheses I'm sure I don't need. I compute intermediate answers and store them because I was losing track of what was pending. <laughs> it's, it's tough. But uh, it does run and does give you the same answers. The HP25 program, L10, that's on the back of this handout, the back page, is 49 steps. I believe it took all 49. The SR56 is 59. 59, so it was 20% longer, and you would have had extra steps available to do something else with it if you wanted, right? The problem is, like any example problem, it depends on what you choose. If you've got a lot of memory access, you're going to run out of steps quick on the SR56, but it all depends. This one was totally at random. I didn't know how it would turn out. I just redid it. Did you time the program execution? Uh, I did not, but they're both, both really quick. So I still would assume it's about 20, 25% slower on the TI. Um, the HP25 advantages in general, a superior programming model, very much so. Yes. Amen and hallelujah. <laughs> uh, it gives a low battery warning. The SR56 will just slowly fade out and you're really in trouble. Uh, it had engineering notation, which is very, very helpful if you're doing real world types of problems. RPN, a percent key, because that can be a pain to try to do in AOS. And it is smaller in general. What advantages does the SR56 have? Well, if you really got some problem, the S subroutine availability is very, very important. You've got looping. I mean, you don't have looping. It's kind of tough to do. You've got to manually do that stuff on the HP25. That eats up steps. Precision and accuracy. Uh, again, it depends on what you're doing, but that can be an advantage here, the SR56. We display memory exchange. That's, that's really a good thing. Otherwise, you've got to recall, X and Y, store round, you know, roll down, that kind of thing. The printer available being lower cost. And then this next one, the program key works while the program is, the pause key works while the program is running. So you're running a program, it's taking a while to, to finish. What's going, what's going on? Am I stuck in an infinite loop? What's the deal? So while it's running, you can do this. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the grad uh, degree switch. This is a program being loaded that simply says plus one equals and goes all the way back to step one and keeps running. It's just a plus count loop. While it's running, if you go and push and hold down the pause key, which is the divide key, it slows down and shows you each intermediate step as it's executing, the results of it. It doesn't show you what step it's on, but if you know your program, you probably are going to be able to figure out, oh, hey, look, it's going 13, 14, 15, okay, it's running. Oh, it's at 28, 29. I don't know of any other machine ever made, to my knowledge, that ever had something like that while, while the program was running. You could hold something on the keyboard and show what it was up to. Right. On the, if I'm looking at this correctly, as you're entering a program, uh, the key codes don't show up until you get out of program mode. Is it, that correct? That is, it shows up. It shows what the key code is of the next step, yeah. which is totally backward. Yeah. <laughs> so it shows you what's coming, yeah. and it's zero yeah, every time I push the key. Yeah, that's look, something missing from your comparison chart. That goes back to the, I, I totally agree with you, that's the ease of programming. That's why I don't like programming this thing very much. Okay. But see what I mean? It's all zeros Yeah, it's all there. zeros. That's what I mean. Yeah. The HP correctly shows what you just keyed in, so you know if you right. did it right. Otherwise, you've got to hit second back step and go look at what you did. <laughs> But uh, this is a very handy kind of feature if you wonder whether your program has gone through la-la land or not. All right, so who is the winner? Who wins? All right, all right. The HP25 wins. It really does. Um, so why do you need one? Why do you need an SR56? Look at that classic style. Look at this thing. 
the lines are just gorgeous. The, the industrial design is incredible, right? <laughs> it's the only calculator in the world with a degrees grad switch. <laughs> Think about how the ladies will feel when you tell them you have one. Yeah, right. And I like it. That's another reason you need one. <laughs> that will scare North Korea because they know now you can use grass to work it. Let's keep them out of the North Korean hand. Seriously, here's the last part of the presentation. I really want to encourage you here, even an HP collector, in my opinion, really ought to have four TI models in your collection. I'm only suggesting four. Okay, four. What would I suggest? 58. Hold on. Don't don't give yours away. Because it's going to be right on somebody. All right. Actually, somebody just said the 52, that's not one of them. The 52 was a, a TI's first card programmable calculator. The card readers never work. Don't bother. Because you can you can use it to prop a door open and keep people out of your house. I was mentioning in passing that comparing the card readers and those calculators is it has exponentially more difficult than doing it somebody. So give up on the SR-52. I have two TI-59 and both card readers work without problems. I'm talking about the 52. The card reader in the 59 goes bad a lot, but it's better than the 52. The 52 is notoriously evil. <laughs> so the first one I really would like to suggest you consider is the SR-50. Yeah. TI finally brought its game and came out with something long after the HP-35, but this is the start of the competition that I think eventually gets us a 41 and 48 in front. So I really think this SR50. Plus, I mean, this, the colors here are just great. Because they eventually things get so sterile, but I mean, the light blue and the orange equal key down there, SR50. So I'd like to encourage you to consider an SR50. And the silver bling. The silver bling up here. By uh, comparison to, I think, the SR51. This is one of those models where TI went you know, really deep into pre-programmed capability. This is, their, their advertising slogan for this was Pre tremendous math power. <laughs> it really was because you have linear regression built in over here with predicting X and Y, hyperbolics, a random number generator. I remember one summer I did that 10,000 times to see what the average was going to be. <laughs> second random number sigma plus, second random number <laughs> sigma plus, 10,000 times. Uh, I needed more to do, that's correct. Uh, I should have. Uh, but this is a great model to have. It's this big brother here, the SR50. It's very hard to find because for only a few months was that version of it available before they changed the industrial design. In the third place, the SR56. Because here you've got their two really big time pre program models. And between their early programmables, I would say the SR-56, well over the SR-52. Richard. Couldn't you have written a program on there to have done that? To have done what? That on the 51. Doing the random? The 51 is not programmable. Oh, okay. It's not programmable. It's and that, that kind of begs the question, how good is a random number generator on a pre program model? <laughs> because they knew high school students would be laying around in the summertime punching it 100,000 times. What was average? I don't remember. I should have written it down. <laughs> All right, so these three, the fourth model, the fourth model, it may not be the one you're thinking of. 58-30. I'm going to argue the 58-C, not the 58 that's shown, but the 58-C. All right, why? Why not the 58 or 59? Constant memory. Because the 58-C gives you the ability to have your program, if you've got one in there, live on. The 59 is going to be more expensive. It loses its memory when you turn it off, and the card reader may or may not work. The 58 has 480 steps that go away when the power is interrupted. Don't bother with it. Get a 58C. You can do that on the 58C as well. Just fewer of them. All right, now what's the other reason I chose these four? There's an important common reason between all four of these. Well, they are available. They all use the same battery pack. It's interchangeable. So if you've got these in your collection and the batteries start dying off, one battery pack that works means all four of these calculators can work. So that's an economy, I believe, that's really important. Yes. That's why they all use the same printer. 
That's why they're all able to use the same printer, although the 58 requires the, an updated version compared to the original PC-100 because they, it had to do alpha characters and stuff There's like that. There's a downside to you saying one battery pack because guess what? As soon as you pull the battery pack out of the 58C, it's dead. Ah, it has capacitors in it that retain program so memory for work. a couple of minutes at least. <laughs> That doesn't give you enough time to fire up the other calculator. The solid state software, the solid state software on the 58 is its plug-in modules that it had several years before the 41 yeah, yeah, came out. Yeah. I still remember the in day I saw these announced where it was 5,000 program steps in a solid state memory, uh, solid state module. Who on earth could ever use 5,000 steps in an RPM module? And they had an RPN module where you would key in the key yes. codes from the HP 67 solution book and it would attempt to spit out a program equivalent. Yeah, well, <laughs> bizarre. I've got a 59. All right, so, with that again, number. four. I'm just suggesting consider four. I'm not trying to make you convert over or even like the old ones, but these are four I think would make a good addition to anyone's collection. Gene, what would a nice 56 go for? Hold on, I'm still smiling, everybody. <laughs> What would a 56 go for anywhere from 50 to $80? Oh, okay, so maybe. Uh, you'll find them with the tabs broken off, so look for a picture. <laughs> Otherwise, you're replacing your bets. Well, look, so in this case, right, we've been talking about TI. Thank you so much. But now, we go back to our regularly scheduled RPN program. <laughs> Thank you so much.